stop the video so that we, we get a better, better uh, picture. And you want me to record it, uh, doctor? Yes, please. Continue, Lovely. okay, record. Okay, I will do that. I've done it, but hopefully yes. I succeed. Okay, here we are. Okay, you can see my first slide. Yes. Yep. Okay, thank you. So first of all, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to speak to you. I mean, uh, we always uh, looked at our teachers with uh, great admiration and some of us were actually in love with some of our teachers. I'm talking about Miss Pirbai and Miss Ahuja and, and people like that. <laughs> anyway, so, um, uh, you know, as Imam has said before that um, the teachers are the leaders of our community. And for me to get this opportunity to speak to you and your friends and your families is a great honor and I truly appreciate it. All right, okay. So we're going to talk about heart attacks and try to think about ways of what we can do ourselves to prevent us from getting a heart attack or prevent us from uh, getting a second one, right? So when we talk about a heart attack, we're talking about blockage in these little arteries that supply blood to the heart muscle. And there, it requires two things. It requires a plaque or a hardening of the artery, usually because of cholesterol. And it requires a clot to form all of a sudden. So there is sudden abrupt occlusion of the artery and the blood supply is suddenly cut off to that area of the heart and that area of the heart muscle starts to die. And that's what is a heart attack. Now the stroke is a completely similar situation. <clears throat> it's the same process in the arteries of the head and neck. And this is how you get a stroke with uh, damage to your brain. <clears throat> this, um, this process of atherosclerosis, excuse me, uh, often begins in childhood and adolescence. So it's been going on for a number of years in most adults. And it is silent, it's clinically silent. And this is why we call it insidious, that it is going on underneath. We are not aware of it. And when it rears its ugly head, it's a disaster right off the bat at the first time that, that you begin to know that you have the problem. And this often occurs when there is this abrupt cessation of blood supply due to a clot forming on top of a blockage which was growing slowly or over a number of years. So the blockage growing and becoming 75% or 90% does not necessarily give you a heart attack. In fact, that slow growth of the blockage can go all the way to 100% and you don't get a heart attack because your heart compensates and there's collaterals and uh, sort of you form your own bypasses and no damage occurs. But when there is this abrupt cessation of blood flow that you have the plaque or the blockage and the clot forms on top of it, that's how you get a heart attack. It's a sudden process. All right, so this hardening of the arteries is the main issue. And yes, uh, genetics plays a role uh, to some degree, but a large extent of the problem is related to our lifestyle and our risk factors and unhealthy diet, uh, lack of exercise, uh, stress, developing high blood pressure, diabetes because of obesity, uh, bad diet leads to high cholesterol, we smoke. So all these factors accelerate the atherosclerotic process. In most people, as we age, there is this atherosclerotic process going on. But when we have these risk factors, we rapidly accelerate the blockage. And so our arteries get older than we are. So we may be 50 years old, but our arteries are already 60 years old. And this is why a 50 year old gets a heart attack. And you say, well, why is a young guy getting a heart attack? Because he's accelerated that process of atherosclerosis. All right, so I'm going to tell you a little story, I'll give you a case report uh, of a real patient that I looked after. Uh, this is a 39-year-old South Asian gentleman who uh, considered himself a 
big time business executive. His father actually had built the whole business empire. And his father uh, had, a, had a heart attack at the age of about uh, 54 or something. Anyway, so he um, presented uh, into the emergency room uh, at the hospital, brought in by ambulance from the bank where he was negotiating something and he had collapsed. So I was called to the emergency room. And as soon as I got there, it became very clear that he was having a massive heart attack and it was involving the whole front area of the main pumping chamber of his heart. And this was uh, a very worrisome uh, process. And most people who have this kind of a heart attack usually do not survive. So we rushed him immediately straight to the cardiac cath lab. We didn't wait for any more blood tests or any other things, just got the consent and rushed him to the, to the cardiac cath lab and immediately um, got the groin um, uh, cleaned up. And I was able to put a catheter from the groin in his right femoral artery and um, get the catheter up towards the heart and engage it into the coronary artery and start injecting dye. And he was fairly unstable. His blood pressure was, was uh, dropping. He was losing consciousness, but still sort of aware. And he was in the throes of this massive heart attack. The heart rate was all over the place. So, <clears throat> we got him into the cath lab and, and proceeded with this angiography procedure, having the catheter put up from the groin all the way to the heart, engaging it in the coronary artery, injecting dye into the coronary arteries. And this is called an angiogram. All right, so this is what we saw. I injecting the, I'm injecting dye here into his left coronary artery. Here's the left circumflex artery, the one that goes to the side. And this is an abrupt total blockage of his big front left coronary artery, which would be supplying blood to this whole area of the heart. So this whole artery supplying blood all over here is totally blocked off right at the top. Well, uh, immediately it was a, a urgent, uh, a, a rapid process. I was able to get a wire in through the artery, through the catheter, up into the artery and through the artery, negotiate the wire through the clot and get it over onto the other side of the clot and allow me to be able to pass a balloon on top of that wire while the heart is beating, he is unstable and I'm working it from 100 centimeters or 110 centimeters away from his heart with the catheter out in the groin. And I'm manipulating this thing, looking at the uh, X-ray screen and uh, blew up the balloon to open up the blockage and then put in the stent to uh, totally uh, get the blockage open and keep it open. So we get in from the groin, we um, get the wire through the clot, get the balloon in there, blow up the balloon, that deploys the stent onto the walls of the artery, deflate the balloon, pull the balloon out, and the blood goes rushing back into this whole area of the myocardium, the heart, which was in the process of dying. Every minute, the heart cells were dying. And now we suddenly replenish the blood into his uh, artery. And you can see that this whole left coronary artery is now open and we have reconstituted it with a, st a stent there and blood is flowing into his, uh, into his myocardium. And the process of the heart attack was stopped in its track. And the first thing as he began to feel more uh, uh, able to talk, the first thing he says to me, I can breathe, I can breathe. I'll never forget those words. Can't hear you. Sorry, Alnur, you have gone. Alnur, you are muted. Can you hear me now? 
Yeah, yeah. Okay, so where did I, where did you lose me? Just go back a couple of minutes. About here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so, you know, through that catheter that I had put in to inject the dye, I was able to get a wire through that clot and through the artery that allowed me to thread another balloon catheter on top of the wire, engage it accurately in the area of the blockage, blow up the balloon, develop a whole passage, and then deploy the stent into the blockage to keep it open. So we get the wire through the, through the clot, we get the balloon catheter on top of the wire, and now we blow up the balloon just accurately and exactly where the blockage is, because the, the balloon pressure is extremely high. 12 to 13 atmospheres of pressure is what I need to use to open that blockage out. If I blow up the balloon three millimeters this way or three millimeters this way, I'm going to burst the artery or tear it. And, and obviously that's not going to be a good outcome. And then we deflate the balloon and pull the balloon back and the blood starts rushing into the artery, which was totally blocked and the stent holds the artery open. And this is the picture where we got the artery totally open and the patient starts to feel better. His pain starts to settle down. And the first thing he tells me is, I can breathe. I can breathe. I, I, I remember those words distinctly. And this is how we stop the heart attack in its process and prevent the damage and, and have these kind of patients survive who would never have survived previously. So I want to tell you, why, why am I telling you this story about this patient. This is how I spent my life over the next last three decades or so doing these procedures day and night, aside from other things in cardiology. Well, it's not for that purpose. The reason I'm telling you this story is because of this. This very patient, this 39-year-old millennial who thinks he knows everything, had come to my clinic three months earlier. And he had no symptoms. He was having a little bit of abdominal fat. His father had a heart attack at the age of 54, but he was a smoker. And I had to convince him to get some blood tests. And he agreed. And we saw that the cholesterol was quite high. And his reaction in general was, I do not want to take medications. And he just said, I want an angiogram because you know he's this millennial who knows everything and he knows what he wants. And my job is to do what he wants. He didn't realize that I was not one of the workers at his industry or at his business. So obviously I wasn't going to do that because that's not the right thing to do. So I say to him, you need your cholesterol control. Diet alone will not work. You need further assessment. We need to see the perfusion test. We need some more specialized blood tests to see if there's a genetic tendency running from your father. He says, no, no, no. I want an angiogram and I know you're going to give me a statin, right? I said, yeah. That is the most effective thing at the moment to start protecting you from getting a heart attack while we are continuing to do other testing and, and doing further assessment. So I gave him the prescription. He says, okay, I'll think about it. He took the prescription and left. This was three months before this heart attack. I find out then that he, during this time when he, <clears throat> he had come in, that he never filled that prescription. He went to Dubai and had this angiogram done. And at Dubai, they told him, don't worry, you just have a minor plaque and, um, you know, there's no blockages. Everything is fine. He comes back to Karachi, cocky as ever, feeling fine, not taking his uh, uh, cholesterol medication. And now he's saying, well, my heart is fine. I don't have to worry about anything. Well, this is what happened to him three months later. And we were able to, thankfully, save his life. So what this story is about is that these kind of minor blockages, which people neglect or say, well, fine, I you just have a little narrowing, there's nothing to worry about, can end up with total blockage like this. And we have to put in a balloon and a wire and stent and get the artery reopened. But very few people are fortunate enough to get to us in time to be able to do that. So, the problem is that these mild to moderate blockages of 30 to 60% are the ones <clears throat> that are most likely to rupture or erode and form a clot 
to cause the abrupt blockade, blockade uh, occlusion. So these minor or moderate blockages that we ignore, which are inside and are not giving us any symptoms, so we feel we are normal, everything is fine, ends up with a heart attack. And this is why, quote unquote, perfectly normal people get heart attacks. Because inside this is going on and they have these mild blockages, and they don't know it. And in about 50% of these people, the first manifestation is a heart attack or they die right there and then. 50% of all people in the world who have this problem die as the, or have a sudden heart attack as their first manifestation. Here is another data showing that almost 60% of men, uh, if there is their first manifestation, who previously were thought to have any a non-existing disease, ended up with a sudden death or a heart attack, and about 45% of women do that. So approximately 50% of men and women have a heart attack or die suddenly as their first manifestation. There is no time to do anything else. All right, so if you are South Asian, <clears throat> this problem is even worse. So I'm not going to belabor a lot of data for you, but I'm going to show you this slide where if you look at South Asians who get heart attacks, 25% of them get them under the age of 40. And 50% of South Asians who get a heart attack get it under the age of 50. Where you look at other ethnic groups, it is under 65 that they get these heart attacks. So we accelerate our disease 10 to 15 years faster than other ethnic groups. And this slide, I want to, don't want to go into details. It's, look, it's done in California. It's an NIH study and red bars are Indians and the green bar is the total uh, group and the other colors are other ethnic groups. And you can see that at every age group over 65, Indians had one and a half times the risk of dying when they had a heart attack. In middle age, they had two times the risk of dying compared to other ethnic groups. And the younger ones under the age of 45 had three times the risk of dying compared to other ethnic groups because they have not developed those channels, those bypasses or collaterals and they get the heart attack and bang, they're gone. So this is a very severe and a significant problem in South Asians. So we get the disease, uh, we have a genetic risk, we have lifestyle factors which compensate, which are ag aggravated. Uh, migration is a strong risk factor. Uh, we get the disease earlier in life. When we get the disease, we have worse survival. And uh, this is the problem. So now you say to me, okay, this is about the first heart attack. What about some of us who have had a heart attack? Well, here is, <clears throat> is some information. If you have had a heart attack before, or if you had a stroke before, you are five to seven times more likely to get another heart attack or die compared to someone who's not had a heart attack. So once your heart arteries have shown that they have the tendency and the ability to block and give you that heart attack, they're telling you, if you don't do something, we're going to block again, and we're going to block again, and we're going to keep giving you heart attacks until you get it in your head that you've got to do something because the risk is extremely high once you've had an event. All right, so what's the, the whole concept? This is the concept I often discuss, used to often discuss with my patients when I was in practice. And this conversation almost always happened once with every cardiac patient who came to see me. And I tried to explain to them that this cardiovascular disease uh, for its management requires two partners. And the reason this disease has developed in you is because of your lifestyle. You accelerated this thing and you have to make an effort to change your lifestyle. We can give you nutrition advice, we can do rehab, we can give you counseling, but ultimately it's your decision, the individual, whether you're going to change your lifestyle. Because if you're not going to change your lifestyle, really 
not much is going to work and everything we do is not going to benefit. So your responsibility as the patient is to change your lifestyle and get things under control. And primarily, if you have diabetes or high blood pressure or cholesterol, or if you've already had a heart attack, you must take your medications that I prescribed to you. Because there's a lot of data which came out even recently, which shows that when patients stop the medication, they have a rebound and they get even a higher risk of heart attack or a stroke. So it is very dangerous to stop those medications. You discuss it with your patient, your doctor and have that happen. So I had this conversation. And then I tell him that I am in the group of lifesavers. I have to make your diagnosis correctly. I have to prescribe the right medicines in the right dose. I have to do the angioplasty when it's needed or my colleagues, or I have to get you to bypass surgery uh, when it is needed to save your life and, and when it is the right thing. And I have to do all that and all that is lifesavers. But your job is the lifestyle. So if, if I don't give you the right medications, or if I mess up during the angioplasty, you're not going to do very well. And your family is not going to be very happy with me afterwards. So it's the same way. If you don't take the medications I prescribe to you, or you don't make the effort to change your lifestyle, and I know it's difficult, then it's not going to work. You do your part, I'm going to do my part right. And that's how we're going to get control of this disease and prevent disasters from happening to you. And when disasters happen to you, your whole family, your, your, your uh, lifestyle uh, uh, network, your business, everybody is impacted. And you have a responsibility to look after yourself for yourself. All right, so this is a, a study published this year in January, which talked about the most important advances in preventive cardiology over the past decade. And look at what they talk about. The newer medications to control blood pressure. The statins, the, we need to use them more in, in terms of saving lives. The right type of diabetic medications which now prevent heart attacks and strokes, unlike the previous older diabetic medications. The right type of fish oil, not the omega-3 that you buy at the pharmacy or the internet. It's the, this is a prescription drug. Uh, the, stronger is, uh, cholesterol lowering drugs. The even stronger cholesterol lowering drugs, which you only have to take twice a year. That's it. You don't have to take a pill every day. You don't have to do it every month. You just take the, the medication two times a year, six months apart, and it just knocks out your cholesterol. Everything's fine. And the inflammation. These are the advan advances in preventive cardiology, which have really begun to save lives. And these are the medication groups uh, that I talk about to my patients as the lifesavers that I'm going to prescribe and they have to take those medications. So we're going to now swing into the positive side of this whole issue. And we're going to say, what can we do as individuals? So I'm going to introduce you to this thing, the concept of effective protections that are already built in, in nature. So nature has realized that there are going to be harmful things in the things we eat and the way we are going to live. And so mother nature has already put in substances and, and set up our human body in such a way that we can have protection against these noxious, noxious uh, uh, substances or lifestyle. So <clears throat> to give you an analogy, you know, you have the seat belt in your car. It's a passive form of protection. So when you get an accident, you do a fender bender or somebody knocks you or something happens, you're unlikely to be thrown around in the car, get a head injury or something. So it's a passive restraint, but it doesn't stop you from getting a heart attack. It doesn't make you drive carefully. It doesn't prevent the fender bender. It doesn't help you park any better so that you're not going to hit your car to the car that's nearby, but it's a passive restraint. So that's like everything else in life that you do that is not going to harm you, which is the seatbelt. What I'm talking about are the sensors in your car, 
you've got this Tesla, it's got sensors all around. A lot of the many new cars now have. They can actually self park by the sensors, knowing where this car is and the other car is, or they, they sense the, the car in the blind spot, so you're not likely to change the lane. And these sensors are things that prevent you from having an accident, help you park so you don't get a fender bender. These are advances that are in these cars that now are proactive and help you drive better and save lives. This is what nature has done. Nature has put these sensors in the environment and in our body. And if we learn to identify or recognize these sensors, we will know what is protective towards us. All right. So first <coughs> sensor is, is all about happiness. It's all about the mind. It's all about the state of mind. And I say here, happiness is the essence of life, fragrance in the rose. So if I'm not doing this poet thing very well, the blame goes to all of you teachers. <laughs> this is the best I can do with my poetry. But you get the message. It's all about happiness. Happiness is a sensor. It protects you over and above the seat belt. It just doesn't prevent, doesn't make you get hurt. So it's a passive thing. Happiness is a positive sensor, works up front to make things better and neutralize some of the bad things that you are doing. So Harvard University conducted a study, which is now, the study is 50 years old. They started the study in 1958. And one of the main findings they found in that study was people who were participating in a community, people who were participating in groups, in clubs, in, 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 uh, in bridge clubs or whatever, where they were with other people and socializing and it gave them pleasure and happiness, actually lived longer. And that long life was associated with good health, better than any of the other things we talk about to maintain good health. So how you socialize is an extremely positive sensor of protecting you. So what else did they find? They found that these relationships are critical and, and they, which is the same thing I'm telling you. And they had never thought that something like this about empathy and, and, and connecting with, with other people and being able to feel their emotions and share with their pleasure or sharing their grief they never knew that this was going to be one of the key ingredients of longevity and, and, and good survival. So what else did they find? They found that couples who had good relationships in their 50s, so in the middle age, you know, you're still going well together, you have a good relationship. And now you look at these couples, when they are in their 80s, they have lived long and this long life is associated with good health. It was a marker. It was a sensor of protecting you for what's going to happen down the road. So this relationship with your mate, with your partner, and compromising, and supporting each other, and being there for each other, sharing in your, in your joys, and, and being there supportive at the time of difficulties and challenges is absolutely health-promoting and is going to make you live longer and, and without disability. So uh, the other issue on the negative side, they found that people who had bad marital uh, relationships or who had loneliness or had depression, their risk of having a bad life in the future or dying earlier was as bad as alcoholism or smoking. And you know, those two are extremely bad. And this loneliness and depression was equally bad as those issues. So I have this thing that with my patients and over the years, I've always been using it. And I get them to understand this issue of relationship and understand this issue of happiness 
and I get them through this uh, happiness index and explain to them at one end is bitterness and being negative and looking at the glass half full and blaming everybody and everybody for anything, not learning to take responsibility. And at the other end of the scale is gratitude, looking at the glass half full, sharing love, affectionate, forgiving, understanding the people. If somebody has pissed you off or has you know, bothered you, don't break the relationship. You often upset other people and stuff. Very soon, nobody is going to be left as your friend. You have to maintain relationships despite the ups and downs because you're doing it for your health. It's important. So this is what I teach them. And every time they come at the six month or yearly follow up and I'm going over things with them, I go over quickly, you know, my life say, life savers, lifestyle, where are you? Happiness index, are you at seven, eight? Where do you think you are? What's going on? Relationship, are you maintaining? Are you joining some club? Are you in a community? Do you go to Kanye? It doesn't matter if you are believing in the faith or not. Enjoy the dandia, the biryani and stuff. And you're happy at that time. That biryani is not going to hurt you. Don't ever bother and worry about jamar and food at Kane with joy and music and stuff. It's not going to hurt you. The happiness and joy is going to counterbalance that. Okay, the next bit of sensors, activity. Activity is not just a seat belt. It's sensors that are going to prevent you from getting the problem or getting the problem again. So being active. I don't use the word exercise with people I teach or with my patients. I talk to them about activity. Activity becomes part of life. Everything you're doing is part of activity. And it is within this lifestyle of living an active life that you become physically active as well, as you become mentally active and socially active. And it is not a chore to go to the gym to exercise or exercise to go walk or something like that. It's about the active lifestyle. All right, so what has nature taught us? Nature has taught us that if you, most of us come from East Africa, you know, you've seen giraffes. I bet you almost none of us have seen a giraffe sitting down or, or, or lying down or sleeping. We don't. Every time we see a giraffe, He's standing, trying to eat the leaves on the, on, the, on the tree, or he's walking. And look at, the legs are thin, the neck is thin, everything is thin. But he's extremely strong and, and functions very well. And his heart is so strong that it can pump blood all the way up seven, eight feet to get to his brain with each heartbeat. But he's lean because he's active all the time. On the other hand, you have these pigs who are lying around in the pigsty, you know, eating, sitting there, just living there with these tiny little feet and this huge fat body. And they, their meat is extremely harmful. And that's what their lifestyle does, which is why they are so fat and they are sluggish. So look at the human beings. What has Mother Nature done? Mother Nature has divided our body into two halves, the lower half and the upper half. All our organs, our brain, our heart, our lungs, our kidneys, our intestines, every liver, everything that is needed for the human body to function is in the upper half of our body. And the whole lower half of the body is absolutely and totally there for you to be active. Mother Nature has told you that. Look, I want you to be active because you will stay well. And therefore I'm creating you in a manner that you have your body capable of doing that. And I'm going to designate 50% of your body for you to be active. There it is. It's right there. You know, we know the Maasai and, uh, you know, we see, we're sitting at the lodge and you see this Maasai far away in the crater and he's walking over. By the time they finish the lunch, he's already there at the lodge and they're dancing and they're active. But what do they eat and drink? They eat meat, they drink milk directly from the cow with blood mixed in. They have a diet 
that one would consider atrocious, but they don't get heart attacks. Why? Because they protect themselves with the sensors of activity. And the day the Maasai start riding motorcycles and eating packaged food and hamburgers, they will be gone in a generation to two generations with this massive epidemic of heart attacks and strokes. They are managing as long as they are active. So this um, photograph, I'm asking you, what do you think is the most dangerous thing in this photograph? There's a whole bottle of whiskey. There's a whole packet of cigarettes. There is this chocolate glazed donuts. There is the hamburger with the fries. Um, and there is, they're all on this chair. I know most of you are thinking different things, but I'll tell you the most dangerous thing in this picture Donut. is the chair. The sedentary lifestyle is a killer. It is now the opposite of the sensor. Now you're driving your car and you're turning off your sensors and you're going to try to park in a tight spot. When you sit for long periods, like we are now, over an hour, over two hours, then everything in your body metabolism runs onto the negative side. You start producing the bad hormones, the endorphins that are bad, the atherosclerotic process begins to permeate. Cholesterol enters into the subendothelial space of the arteries. Everything bad starts to happen. Sitting is equally or more dangerous than smoking. It is what we now call the new smoking and some people call sugar the new smoking, which is true and so equally bad is, is smoking. And this is data which shows that if you're physically fit, <clears throat> your death rate is extremely low. If you, are, if, if you are not physically fit, you're more likely to, to die sooner. Doesn't matter what else. You just take 13,000 men and women out there who think they are healthy and you just look at how physically fit they are and you can predict who's going to live longer or who's going to die sooner. All right, so exercise is the wrong word. It's all about activity. You have to incorporate the activity into your lifestyle. Live an active lifestyle, socially active, emotionally active, sexually active, physically active. And that's how you're going to stay healthy and stop disability down the road. So you take pride in this activity, the lifestyle you're living. You deserve it, it's for yourself. Start this program slowly and increase gradually. And if you need to be in groups or gyms or so, fine. 10 or 20% of people can't do it on their own. They need a, 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 you know, a, a partner or somebody who is a positive en enforcer. And I've talked to you about sitting. Avoid sitting for long periods. Use the stairs. Park somewhere farther in the mall and then walk to the mall. Then you buy the groceries or the goods. You walk back to the car while you've got 200 or 300 meters of, of activity mixed in there and it didn't take any extra effort and your car nobody dinked the door of your car because you parked farther away you know squeezed in right near the, the close to the mall entrance at the door you understand what i'm talking about you know the bike uh, during the uh, watching news or hockey game or walking up and down during the hockey game and, and and watching you will find that you enjoy it more and you can do so much activity and it's all incorporated into your lifestyle. Okay, next set of sensors that Mother Nature has been built in. So I don't call it diet. I don't call it, you know, good foods, bad foods. I call it nutrition. Nutrition is what you enhance your body with. And nutrition enhances the functioning of your body and the longevity of your body. All right. The first sensor out there are fruits and vegetables. And I'm going to show you in a minute how you're going to identify those. And those are the, one of the most positive sensors out there that Mother Nature has put in there, that if you eat more of these fruits and vegetables, you are going to prevent yourself from getting this atherosclerotic disease and actually compensate and balance maybe the two samosas you had uh, uh, during the time that you went out somewhere and you're not going to feel guilty about it 
because you're going to counterbalance it with the positive sensors, the positive mm -hmm. protection mechanism. And here is data to show that people who eat a lot of fruits and vegetables uh, tend to have much lower coronary heart disease events. And those who eat a lot of legumes, uh, grains and, and dal and, uh, and beans uh, tend to have much lower cardiovascular events. And so I developed this program. It's almost now 20 years have gone by since I developed this program and I called it 00530. And then in the last few years, I have modified this program and I'll show you. So zero stands for zero smoking, zero stands for zero alcohol. And that to me is the absolute ideal. And this is not an alcohol talk but I would happy to give you an alcohol talk someday and tell you how totally ridiculous this thing is. But at least cut it down to as little as possible. Five stands for more than five servings of fruits and vegetables per day. And you're going to think, oh my, how am I going to get five servings of fruits and vegetables into me in a day? And I'm going to show you, it's extremely easy. And more than 30 minutes of activity per day is what you want to do. So that's the double zero five thirty program. So what I call a serving, what's called a serving is what you can hold in your fist, you know? So a half a cup full of berries or fruit or half a cup full of vegetables is one, is, is one serving. So if you have a bowl of salad, that's one and a half or two servings. If you have, you know, a large fruit or a, or a cup of, of fruit, uh, mixed fruit, that's about two and a half servings of fruit. So the combined servings need to be more than five and it's very easy to do. So I have now modified the program to help people to recognize these sensors. How are you going to recognize these sensors out there that mother nature has put in that are going to protect you? How are you going to pick your foods? So I added this color and speed. So color works for everything that's not a meat. So it's not poultry, it's not meat, it's not seafood. It's about plants and vegetables and fruit and legumes and, and nuts and all that kind of stuff. So color works for that. So if you look at the fruits and vegetables or the, or the nuts or the legumes or the beans, the more colorful they are or the more color is there in the beans and they are dark or more color is there in the in the nuts, so they are darker, like walnuts compared to peanuts. Then the darker nuts, the darker legumes, the brighter fruits and vegetables with more color are the ones that have that incredibly protective phytosterols and the antioxidants and all those good things that you need that will go into your body and properly protect you. And all that stuff you buy on the internet, the antioxidants and phytosterols and pick them up at the pharmacy store and stuff will absolutely not give you any benefit. Proven again, again, and again. So you just look at the food. And if it's bright colored and it's got lots of colorful, uh, you know, fruit or vegetables or darker nuts, you know, that's the right thing to eat. So you don't need to come ask me that is potatoes better or, or, uh, or red peppers better. Well, obviously red peppers are better, potatoes are pale and white, you know, when you eat them inside. So it's, it's very clear. I can teach that to, a, to a, a, a lady in Hunza who has never spoken English, or I could teach that to a group of teachers who are so professionally educated as yourselves and it's straightforward and anybody can learn it. Anybody can follow it. You don't need to go to a nutrition classes or pay $200 to join any program. So in the other side of the coin, therefore, is to avoid foods that are white in color or, or pale. So the processed sugar, the, the processed starch, the rice, bread, potatoes, pasta, noodles, the flour, or this product, the butter that's this processed dairy product, ice creams and other creams, lard, all that kind of stuff that is processed and, and refined and it looks pale or white is danger, is danger. 
it's absolutely going to harm you. And it may actually negate the protective sensors that you're going to take in. So what, do you, what should you avoid? Avoid anything that looks white or, or pale, except for a couple of things I'll tell you. So sugar and starch are the most bad things. Sugar you get from sweetened beverages, fruit juices, and you'll be surprised. Almost everything from in, that you get in the bakery or, or desserts or, or, or desserts made from dairy <clears throat> and the empty starch calories, rice, bread, potatoes, pasta, noodles, rice, bread, potatoes, pasta, noodles. My patients get that. They can recite that in their sleep because I drum it into them. And then the fried food, oil, oil, any oil, once it's heated, it develops trans fats. Doesn't matter how good the oil was, it was olive oil or polyunsaturated or this or that. Once it's heated, and particularly if it's reheated, like you're frying samosas or French fries at McDonald's, that trans fat is absolute poison to the lining of your arteries. So you have to avoid fried foods. That doesn't mean when it's kushali and there's samosa, you go to your daughter's uh, uh, wedding and there's samosa, that you don't eat that. It's all about balancing things. But you're not going to eat fried foods every day and have chevro and nan katai and, and things all the time for your, for your snacks, all right? And packaged foods, as soon as foods are processed or packaged, we adulterate. As soon as you adulterate food from its original state to another state, whether it's cooking or whether it's processing the food, you are making it more and more unhealthy. So you go to avoid. So when you go to the grocery store or you go to the deli, you see this aisle here on the bottom left, you are not going to go near that aisle, period. There is nothing on there that you ever want to eat. If it's in a packet or it's in a can or a tin, it has been processed to a level where it's going to harm you, all right? The chips have, have trans fats in them, sugar in the sweetened drinks, fries over, over fried, you know, the, the biryani cooked in a lot of oil and, 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 um, <clears throat> and other, other noxious uh, uh, food processes, you know, the baked goods, the ice creams and, and desserts such as those. So what do we do at our house? In our house, we say that we are going to have three meals, generally. And we are going to eat things that we like. And they are not always going to be totally, totally nutritious. But... With every meal, we are going to have a plate on the table that has sliced cucumbers or, 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 or <coughs> tomatoes or, or carrots or something with a little bit of olive oil on it, balsamic vinegar, some black pepper, maybe a little bit of feta cheese, whatever you fancy and keep changing it. But a plate of that has to be on there aside from whatever else you are going to eat at breakfast or at lunch or at dinner. That is as much a prerequisite on the table as your fork or your spoon is on your table. You can't eat anything else unless this is on your table. We end every meal with some fruit, uh, whether we eat the fruit directly or cut up the fruit and eat it uh, as mixed fruit or whatever we always end a meal with some fruit. And at dinner time or with the main meal, if we are having as a main course, a meat dish, whether it's fish or poultry or beef, we then always have a bowl of salad with it. So we have salad and then we have fresh fruit for dessert. That is already 10 to 15 servings of fruits and vegetables in a day. And once you exceed seven or eight, you are getting more protection than stopping smoking or stopping, um, uh, you know, uh, 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 <coughs> uh, getting your cholesterol under control or your uh, blood pressure. So you get the point. 
These are protective. They're not just passive seat belts. And you know, you know about the, the king of fruits, pomegranate, the king of uh, vegetables, beets. They have so much color in them that when you eat them, you know, your fingers are red, your lips are red, you got it on your teeth. When you smile, it's still there. And beets, the next day you go to the washroom to, to pee and, and the urine is, is red uh, and because there is so much color, it overflows. And that's why there is so much protection built into these foods that have so much color. All right, so what about speed? So color is, is involving things that have, that have, um, that have um, vegetables and fruits. Speed takes care of meats. So it's about <clears throat> land meats. So you look at the meat that you're going to eat and think about that meat when it was alive. If it's a pig or lamb, it moves very little. It is sluggish. It's a deer or a chicken flies faster. Deer runs faster. That meat is going to not harm you as much as meat from a slower moving land animal. And the cow and the goat are somewhat balanced in between and lean meat from the cow or goat is not harmful. Did you hear me? Lean meat from the cow or goat is not harmful, all right? So seafood, it's the same way. The surface swimming fishes like, like this, the salmon, trout, tilapia, they swim fast and they have the oils in them, particularly things like sardines. And they are sensors. They actually protect protect you from having atherosclerotic heart disease. Whereas this fish that swim at the bottom of the ocean or the lake, the, the bottom feeders, they, they don't have the protective oils in them. And same goes for shellfish, craw, crawls, uh, prawns or lobster. They swim very slowly or they actually are attached to the rock and sitting there, there uh, sluggishly. And therefore they are more harmful than, than the other, other foods. So all you have to do is think of speed. If you're going to eat a meat or, or poultry or seafood, just think of how fast that thing moved when it was alive. And if it moved very slowly or was sluggish, you're eating something wrong. If it was swimming fast or, or flying fast or, or swimming fast, you are going to be eating not something that's not going to harm you only, but it's going to additionally give you those protective sensors. So, double zero, five, 30, color and speed. Is it really true? Have I been selling this program and is there evidence for it? Here is a study recently published in 2018 involving over 200,000 people in over 50 countries. It was called the PURE study, involved a lot of other research uh, groups together. And they looked at what was the unhealthy diet, white stuff, rice, bread, potatoes, pasta, noodles, you know, uh, cooked uh, processed flour, pancakes, syrup, sugar, uh, you know, chips with trans fats, desserts with uh, sugar and, and various uh, saturated fat, the sweetened drinks, and on the other hand, they looked at the diet, a healthy diet. Look at this, colorful fruits and vegetables, dark legumes, milk, fresh cheese is okay as long as you don't process the dairy and make other things out of it like butter or ice cream or, or, or desserts and stuff. Buttermilk is good, it is not harmful. And the fast swimming seafood and with, with some veggies there, fresh cut up. Lean meat is okay as long as you don't fry it, as long as you don't cook it in a lot of oil. You barbecue it, you broil it, you grill it, saute it. It's going to not hurt you. All right, so here's the data from that study. Those people who followed my double zero five thirty diet, as you can see, that's what it was, died much less. They had a much better survival than those who followed the white you know, white rice, sugar, potatoes, pasta, noodles diet, and they had less coronary events. And the conclusion was that the pure healthy diet score 
comprised of higher intakes of fruits, vegetables, nuts, legumes, and I've taught you how to pick them, the fish, dairy, and meats, and I've told you if they're swimming fast, you're okay, or, or running fast, they lower mortality. It's not just that they increase your mortality or do not increase your mortality. They actually lower your mortality and improve your survival. So fruits and vegetables and legumes satisfy three sides of the coin. Yes, three sides of the coin. They predict whether you're going to get a heart problem or not. So if you take more of these, you're less likely to get a heart attack. If you take less of these, you're more likely to get. So they have a predictive function. They work on the inside, which is the second side of the coin. They work on the inside of the coin, whether it's a gold coin, silver coin, nickel coin. They actually integrally work as catalysts and enzymes or as cofactors to stop the atherosclerotic process occurring in the subendothelial space of the artery. So they are positive modulators of the atherosclerotic process by slowing it down or stopping it as catalysts or coenzymes or as cofactors. And they work on the third side of the coin, which is the other side. And that if you take more of them, you actually improve your outcomes and you're more likely to survive and less likely to get a heart attack. So these satisfy the Abdullah three sides of the coin. So <clears throat> shall I uh, finish this last part of the holistic approach to, to healthy life? Shall I? Because yeah, go ahead. Late. I think you know, we have a, a session for Q&A, but uh, hopefully- uh, yeah, but We started can... fairly late. Yeah, thank yeah. you. And my fault, my fault. <laughs> no, 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 I'm not talking about fault. I, I think this is really the most important part. Okay, please go ahead. Thank you, thank you. I appreciate that and I appreciate the opportunity and I beg forgiveness for all of you for going a little over. All right, this is what I call my successful survival primordial prevention program, where you live a long, healthy life without disability and dependency. And the whole program is based on the letter S. That's where the secrets are. All right, so S for stress. You want to avoid stress. And there are two kinds of stress that are harmful to the heart. The stress you get at work by being part of middle management. You're not the union worker who just works, gets your pay, the, uh, you know, the clock goes, you go home, you don't worry about the job anymore. That's it, you're done or you are in the executive part or the ownership group, and you can go to work when you want, leave when you want, take your time off, go on holidays when you want, decide how and who you want to work with or whatever. You have that freedom. But if you are in that middle group where you are competing for your job, for promotion, for pay raises, you're competing with your peers, uh, your, your uh, outcome matters, your quality of work matters, you are under constant stress. That stress is harmful. The other stress that's harmful is emotional stress. And emotional stress is, is things like marital uh, discord and the pain you get or the difficulty you have with your children. Another person, a distant friend or a contact may say something to you, insult you in a group of people or, or say something. You're going to probably let it go. You're going to go home, not really be bothered by it and forget but you are in this big group of people and lots of people who know you and, and your son is there. And he says those very same rude or insulting things to you. You are going to feel terrible. And that's the difference. The stimulus is the same. They both say the same thing, but one has emotion attached to it. And that's a killer. And so relationships with family and, and, and your partner, is a very important thing for, for a healthy lifestyle. As for silence, and here I'm talking about silence of the mind. You have to learn to silence your mind. And the extreme form of that, the formal form, is meditation. But taking a walk in nature on your own, close to the ocean or lake or walking in the woods, being close to nature, silencing your mind, 
just letting go and being relaxed, that is a positive sensor. It's a protective thing. Sleep. You need at least seven hours of sleep. So you go to bed at midnight, 12, 11.30, 12 o'clock. You get up at 7.30, 8 o'clock. You say, oh, I got my seven, eight hours sleep. No. But if you went to bed at 10 p.m., 9.30, 10 o'clock, you got up at 5.30, 6 o'clock, you got the same seven and a half, eight hour sleep. But this sleep is going to protect you because of when you went to sleep. So you're going to tell me, well, I can't fall asleep. You know, I'm used to watching the news at 11. And they're watching Netflix and the movie. And, you know, I don't, if I go to bed early, I'm just tossing and turning. And I can't fall asleep and stuff. I say, fine. Don't worry about it. Keep going to bed whenever you're going. I'm not going to make you change that. But do what I'm telling you to do. If you're getting up at 9.30 or so, get up at 8 or 8.30. If you're getting up at 8.30 or 8 o'clock, get up at 7.30. If you're getting up normally at 7.30, 8, uh, 7, 7 o'clock, get up at 6 o'clock or 6.30. Go or get up at 5 a.m. What happens when you are awake around 4, 5, 6 a.m.? The positive effect of the hormones and the endorphins is called the circadian rhythm, starts out and starts protecting you and getting you ready for the challenges of the day. But if you have missed that time and sleep later, or if you went to bed late, you have knocked off the circadian rhythm and therefore you're not getting the benefit. So I say to you people, don't worry, go to sleep whenever you're going to sleep. Just wake up earlier and earlier. Every few weeks, you just wake up half an hour, hour earlier. And very soon, you're going to be tired by 10 o'clock or 9.30, and you will want to go to sleep by that time. And you get in bed with your partner, use that time, quality time, discuss things, what happened in your life that day, what discuss about the children. Use that time, quality time to build and nurture that relationship. S is for social. And I've gone over that about the Harvard study, and I'm pretty sure you got it all. It's about social health. All right, so uh, what about diet and the secret S? This whole slide deals with how to eat and when to eat. It doesn't have anything to do with what you eat. So I tell my people and who are my, uh, my patients and who I'm teaching, don't worry about what you eat. First, learn how to eat and when to eat. So learn to eat slowly. We don't eat slowly. We've got a piece of steak, we're cutting it, we load the potato, mashed potato, we got it in our mouth and we grab the little uh, cauliflower or the Brussels sprout. Now we're cutting the next piece and we're chewing that. We don't even really recognize the taste. Now we've got the other piece ready, loaded with the mashed potato, loaded and it's in there, or it's the biryani, we've got one full spoonful and then we've got the other spoon. We shovel food. We don't give time for food to be chewed properly. You don't enjoy the taste. The taste buds are only in your mouth. And if you slow down your eating, you get more enjoyment from the food. But more importantly, you allow time for the proper vagal responses, the autonomic nervous system to do its job with the satiety center in your brain and the stretch of your stomach. And it will make you eat less and you will have felt full with less food and talk to people, eat with other people and socialize so that you're talking, but don't talk with the mouth full. So wait until your mouth is full and so. So then you are even delaying the next mouthful. And one trick you have to start is you eat with your fork or your spoon and you put it in your mouth. You must put the fork or the spoon down. That's it. That's all you have to learn to do. And then you keep chewing. And when the food is gone and you've talked to whoever you're talking to, then you pick up the fork or the spoon and load up the next piece of steak or the biryani or whatever. It's about slowing it down. And the other thing is S for sequential. You go to a buffet, you go to a wedding, you go to someone's party, there's all this food laid out, the salads and the, and the appetizers and the different, you know, uh, 
uh, uh, pieces of fish and and appetizer things, and then the then the uh, chicken, curry, or whatever, and then the, the meat, you know, goat goat biryani, and then you've got the prime rib already ready there to take. And what most people do is they go with their plate and they just load up, and they're already looking at towards the down the table what's there and what's not there because they know they don't want to fill up the plate too much so they fill up their plate with the healthiest food as little as possible up front the salads and the and the legumes and, and fruits or whatever and they leave space for the fried um, pieces of fish or uh, the samosa or then the goat uh, curry and uh, rice and then they make sure there is enough room left because they get a nice big piece of uh, prime rib and then they go to their table and they shovel it all in. You're killing yourself. You eat sequentially. You go to the table, get the thing that is healthiest. You are very hungry, so you're going to eat it. And then you go back to your table <clears throat> and eat that and talk and socialize. And then you get up get to the next table, talk, say hi to your friend, discuss something, go back to the, uh, to the buffet, and then you get something else, you come and you enjoy that, and, and then the same thing, you go back, and then by the time you're at the goat curry and the rice, I'm telling you, you'll put very little of it, or you may actually skip it, and then you'll just have a small piece of the primary. You will have enjoyed all the food much more. You will have slowed down the process, you will not have looked like a pig and you will have made yourself healthy. All right? Supper. You have to eat early. 6, 7 p.m. is the latest for the last meal of the day. That doesn't mean you don't have a snack or something before bedtime or later around 9 o'clock. But have a healthy snack. Have some yogurt, ice cream and fruit. Have some nuts. Things like that. And, and you will be uh, safe. As for separate. Separate the dessert from the main meal. Don't keep staying at the table and let the dessert be served. Don't sit at the, at the uh, table at the restaurant and order your dessert. Go, get up, get around, go to another place, to a cafe or somewhere else, and go have your dessert there and socialize and stuff. Allow time between your dessert and your main meal. I guarantee you will eat less dessert or you may even skip it. Small frequent meals are better than large meals at one time. And there's a lot of science behind that. And I don't have to go into it. And how you cook your food is critical. No frying, okay? Air frying, people ask me, yes, it's a little better than deep uh, frying, but uh, in the oil, but it's all frying. You'd rather saute your food, barbecue it, broil it, lean meat. It's not going to harm you. Hear me. I don't care what any other nutritionist is going to say to you. It's not going to harm you. So this is how and when you eat. Then if you want to learn further what you eat, I've talked to you already. As for sugar, avoid anything that has sugar in it. And most of the time, it's things you don't think have sugar in it, have sugar in it. <clears throat> and this is the things that come out of a packet. A lot of the cereals that make good the sugary drinks. <clears throat> Eating fruit is fantastic. Drinking fruit juice is poison. That's the difference about how these sensor protectors are packaged by nature to get into your body to, 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 uh, to protect you. As for starch, I've told you about rice, bread, potatoes, pasta, noodles. Rice, bread, potatoes, pasta, noodles. Processed rice, processed flour. Be very careful of that. And speed and color helps you pick the, the plants and fruits. Uh, color does. And speed for the meats and, and, uh, and the seafood and uh, poultry. All right. So what about activity? Sedentary. Just learn not to sit for an hour or two longer. Get up. If you get a phone call, get up and pick up the phone and answer and walk around. We're watching the hockey game. Get up and walk around. And get angry with your referee for the penalty. And, you know, do that. Don't sit in your seat and move your legs and, you know, the referee. Just walk around and, and then go back sit. You are not going to harm yourself. 
when you're watching TV, sports, get around, do activity. So park farther from the mall entrance. All those little things. Sedentary is a killer. So this slide, you should either take a, a screenshot of it or you should tattoo it on your forehead, on your forearms. It should be on every mirror in your house. It should be on the fridge. It should be on the dashboard of your car. It should be everywhere. The point is, you should know this slide. If I wake you up in the middle of your sleep, you're going to tell me everything that's on this slide. And that's when you will know how to live healthy and prevent another heart attack or prevent getting a heart attack in the first place. As for smoking, you don't want it. As for sedentary, you don't want it. As for eating slow and sequentially is the way how to eat. What not to eat is the S's, the sugar, starch, speed and color helps you pick the foods. Stress, attached with emotion is a killer. Stress like I am having now, preparing this presentation, giving it to you, is stressful and it's taking a lot out of me. I enjoy it. It's making a positive impact. I'm trying to transfer knowledge. This is never going to hurt me. This hard work has never killed anybody. All right? As for silence, learn to silence your mind. Don't have your mind rushing all the time. All right? Get close to nature, whether it's meditation or walks or whatever. And be a social animal. Mankind is created to be gregarious in communities, in groups, socializing, not eating alone. All that kind of stuff is important. And don't try to do all this at once. You will fail. I will fail. Everybody will fail. Just pick one or two things from this list and say, okay, I'm just going to do that. And over the next two to three months, master it. And therefore you are successful. Then add another thing. And then you just carry on with that for the next two or three months. Then add one or two more things. By the end of a year, you will be a new man or a new woman. Your children, your millennial children will come home to visit you. Or when you go visit the grandchildren, they're going to be shocked at you. And, and people at, at most can say, oh my God, you look so good. I guarantee you that it will take less than a year if you follow this program. So remember, lifesavers are important. Lifestyle is your responsibility. There are many things that we have now proven that medications that are, that are preventive and helpful. And so listen to your doctors, particularly if you've had a heart attack already or a stroke, these medications are absolutely critical. And inferior doctors treat the full-blown full disease. Mediocre doctors treat the disease before it's evident. Superior doctors learn to prevent the disease. This was said by the Chinese in 2600 BC. Well, I'm not entirely sure of the real date. That's the way the research shows. But even if it was 1400 years ago, it is absolutely true today. It's all about prevention, so you can have a long, healthy life without disability. Thank you. Thank you for giving me the opportunity, and I apologize again for having gone over time. Thank you. I'll be happy to take any questions. Okay. Well, for the questions, uh, there are a number of people who want to ask questions. There is a number of ways you can do it. Uh, ask a doctor direct question, uh, send it by chat, or there is a, a reaction button which uh, you can put your hand up. So you can unmute yourselves and let's start. We have some time to ask questions. Yeah, Zubeda, is that okay? Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. So first question, please. Uh, Farida, you said you wanted a question. Yeah, I do. Yes. Um, hi, hi, Dr. Abdullah. How are you? I'm well, thank you. My, my sister Zubeda and Firoz, my brother-in-law, had sent me the link. So I'm, I'm not a teacher, as you know. You know me personally. <laughs> but I just have a question. Yeah. I suffer with SVD. Um, SVD, ventricular tachycardia. SVT. SVT yeah. as you talk. Yeah. Okay. yeah. SVT. Sorry, T. I meant T, not D. Yeah. Um, <laughs> 
and I've had ablation done. Yes. One. Now this was done at the end of uh, December. Right. But it's recurred again. I yes. am now undergoing the same problem that I had previously to the ablation. Yes. So I want some info. I know I am going to be. Okay, I got your question. And okay. I, I, I'm, okay. I think I'll okay. be able to answer it. Okay. okay. So SVT is supraventricular tachycardia. It's an electrical malformation, malform, electrical disease of the heart. So instead of the heart beating rhythmically, all of a sudden it's beating at 180, 200 times a minute. And you get palpitations and sometimes the blood flow is very poor and you get faint or you may pass out. So that occurs because in the electrical system in your heart, there is a portion that is um, misbehaving. There is a very specific spot in, right in the middle of your heart. The two upper chambers, two lower chambers, right at the, the junction, right in there. And that little spot misbehaves. And every once in a while, it just wants to take off and, and give you this uh, tachycardia. So when you do an ablation, you put a catheter up from your groin uh, in the inferior vena cava, you get it into the right upper chamber, and then just before it enters into the right lower chamber, you position it to where that spot is that's causing the tachycardia, and then you burn it. Either you burn it with laser energy or you freeze it with cryo uh, precipitation. There are many methods, a radio frequency. And so basically you're trying to destroy that irritating part. And almost always with SVT, uh, which is not a life-threatening arrhythmia, uh, with SVT, you get successful results. And in some cases, it recurs because we try not to overkill the area. Because if we overkill, we're going to damage the conduction system and you're going to end up with a pacemaker. And I'm sure they told you that that's one of the risks. So we always undershoot, okay? So we undershoot and most patients do fine, but then, then when we undershoot, um, uh, then it can recur. And if it recurs, then you go back and have the procedure again, because you know the procedure. It wasn't a big deal. Now you are aware about it. You should just go ahead and do it instead of having to take medications or pills for the rest of your life. And you also have very high cholesterol. I can tell you that right now. So far, they have... Uh, they have. They have not control. checked it properly. They have to look at the difference. Those things around your eyes are an absolute marker of that. Seriously? I can well, tell you I, 100%. I, okay, thank you. I'll uh, get my GP to repeat my blood work again. <laughs> well, there has to be a full, pa a full profile of the lipid. Done. Okay, next question. Uh, I uh, think Parviz had a question. Parviz? Sorry. Parvish, you got a question? Yes. Uh, Why I don't wanted you go to ask, uh, uh, I'm pretty healthy so far. Uh, you've been talking about a lot uh, uh, about the food that we eat. But all the food that we Indians eat, you have to have rice and curry. The oil is, uh, oil is always there. So how yeah. can you avoid uh, uh, the food then? Yeah. We have come to this country, we have migrated, we have no trouble wearing Western clothes, we have no trouble dyeing our hair, we have no trouble wearing fancy dancy uh, glasses, whatever, we have no trouble going out and uh, having a wine and all that stuff because we are assimilating into this culture. Well, assimilate with diet as well, all through your diet. Okay, I know for the Indian sub-Indian uh, sub, uh, continent culture, Diet is the most important, but take, make an effort slowly. First, learn how to eat and what to eat. So you don't have to change your diet. And then you gradually move uh, further. And if you do what we do in our household, have that plate of uh, cut tomatoes or cucumbers and stuff there at every meal. Doesn't matter if you're eating uh, you know, an omelet or a, or a biryani or whatever else or a steak. You have that at every meal. And if you're having you as a main course, fish, meat, or, or, uh, or, or seafood, uh, seafood or, or poultry, make sure you have salad as well. And every meal finishes with the fruit. So 
you know, then you can do very well. You can enjoy the, uh, the, the thing. It's about 20, 80, 80, 20 rule. 80% of the time be good, 20% of the time be happy. And if you are happy doing what you're doing 20% of the time, it will counterbalance the bad, what you're doing 20% of the time. Okay, and I, I have the cholesterol problem. Uh, um... Can we go to another, to, another I person? I was asked to take uh, Lipitor, 10 milligram. Yes. And I've been taking it for last, what, uh, 25 years now? Good. And uh, my doctor says you can't leave it. Yes, because I just told you in the talk, if you are listening carefully, if you stop it, there's going to be a rebound and you're more than likely going to get a heart attack or a stroke. So you have suppressed your cholesterol. The body has gotten used to it. And now you are protected. You release that protection. It's like you're going on the freeway, 120 kilometers an hour. You're, you're going on the off-ramp. You're putting on the brakes, but you are midway through the, through the off-ramp and there's car stopped at the stop sign down below and you, you just take your foot off the brake. What's going to happen? You're going to have a multi-car collision and you're going to end up as a vegetable in the hospital. Okay, so I have to continue. Don't take your foot off the brake. So I have to continue this till Laila Ilala. Well, no, no. You just have to continue as long as you don't, don't want to get a heart attack or a stroke. As soon as you want one, just stop it. No problem. <laughs> uh, Amuru, uh, I've got a question from Shamash. So Shamash, go ahead. No, no, no. It's, it's phenomenal to listen to you. I have a daughter who's in cardiology. And she has never lectured me this good. So I really <laughs> would like her to listen to, to you and then lecture me. So I would do that. The question that I had was a very simple one. You know, we do get physicals and uh, routine exams and everything else done on a regular basis. And for a while, we had uh, what's called an annual CT scan. And they would give us a calcium score along with your arterial blockage and everything else. Uh, but so, sometimes my cardiologist says, "Yeah, it's good to have the, you know, the the uh, scan. Yeah, the car, uh, the calcium score. But it's more important for you to come and get your stress test done." So okay, I got the question. I got the whole issue. Okay, so you're talking about a CT scan of the heart to do a calcium score. That's, that's different from what is called a CT angiogram, where we do the calcium score and at the same time inject dye into your vein, not through a catheter all the way into your heart, but in just the arm vein. And we can see all the arteries, we can see the walls of the arteries, see where the blockage is developing, and get a complete picture of the circulation, your valves, the chamber sizes, everything. So if you can, every one of you, if you can get a CT angiogram done and your doctors will push you to just get a CT coronary calcium score, mm. that's part of the CT angiogram. You want the whole test. And once you have that test done, mm. you now have a risk prediction from the calcium score and you right. have an anatomical information of where you stand. Yeah. Then you know how important it is for you to follow what I've been teaching. How important is it for you to take those medications? Parviz, are you listening? Okay. I am. <laughs> and, <laughs> so those things are, are critical. So the coronary CT angiogram is one of the best tests we have now in cardiology. Uh, and I think for anybody who is at risk, who is a South Asian into middle age, it's a high cholesterol or a family history or something, should have this data. Now, you don't have to have it repeated very often because you have the picture, right? So you don't now need to do that for five years because you've got all the prediction, everything done. Mm -hmm. Now you need to take your statin that's going to prevent that calcium score from rising. And you're going to take the statin, which is going to lower it. And you're going to eat those colorful fruits and vegetables. They're going to stop those blockages from getting worse and actually make the blockages to dissolve. So then you know what you have to do. It's given you the full blueprint of what to do in order to build that 59 story skyscraper. That's the blueprint. 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Is that correct, Is that? Uh, okay. Uh, Alnur, sorry. Is there any more questions? Anybody? I have a question or two, but uh, uh, Shanta, you got a question? Shanta, you got a question? Unmute yourself, Shanta. Unmute yourself, please. Shanta. Okay, you're unmuted now. Okay, muted. She muted again. Oh, oh. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Can you hear now me? You can talk. Yes, yes, we can now. Yeah. Good. Go um, ahead. I want to know something about atrial fibrication. If you have some, uh, what are the precautions you should take? Okay. Atrial fibrillation is, is, is a group of rhythm problems. And the common thing for all the people who have atrial fibrillation is that this electrical arrhythmia arises in the left upper chamber of the heart from where the pulmonary veins enter. So everyone who has atrial fibrillation has this thing happening there. And the thing with the atrial fibrillation is that focus starts to fire off very, very rapidly. And it's firing off 300 to 500 times a minute. So it's essentially quivering. And that fast number of responses cannot get into the ventricle. So 100, 150 get through and your heart rate is 100, 150. But as opposed to the supraventricular tachycardia, which is regular fast, this is irregularly irregular, completely. You can't predict where the next beat is going to go and come or what it's going to do. So it makes your heart pump very inefficient. And this atrial fibrillation can occur in the presence of you having some other heart trouble, like having had a heart attack or heart failure or valve disease, or it can occur in people who do not have any other heart trouble, but get only this primary electrical problem, which gives them atrial fibrillation. So this is a, a <coughs> arrhythmia that needs to be treated by your cardiologist. You need to control the rate. There are ablation procedures which need uh, can be undertaken to, to, uh, to try and cure the problem. Uh, the underlying heart disease has to be treated if it's present to decrease and control that heart disease. And therefore, the fibrillation won't occur. You need to thin your blood because the atria are beating at three to 500 times a minute. The blood is stagnating in there. It's clotting. With the next beat, that clot is going to fly off into the circulation and give you a stroke. So you need to have blood thinners continuously taken if you have this atrial fibrillation problem. So it's a complex thing. And my advice to you is I'm just giving you a little bit of education, but please, please listen to your cardiologist and follow what he or she tells you. Thank you. Please put me on blood thinners. Now. I was wondering whether having a pacemaker would uh, stabilize the beating. The pacemaker is only useful. Now this may answer a lot of other questions. So I'll just go ahead and finish that. Mm. Pacemaker, the only thing the pacemaker can do is prevent your heart rate from going too slow. Okay, mm -hmm. so if you have the, your own pacemaker getting sick, uh, like sick sinus syndrome or, or a block at the, uh, at the junction box, like if we did the ablation for the SVT too badly and we knocked off the junction box, now the heart rate is down to 10 or 20, then we have to put a pacemaker in to beat the heart at 70, 80, 100, mm -hmm. whatever you want. So the pacemaker is only there to deal with the slow heart rate. Now in atrial fibrillation, we need medications to control the heart rate. We don't want the ventricles to be contracting at 150, 200 times a minute. Mm. So we give medications to slow the heart rate. The problem is, is finding that happy medium. Sometimes we slow it too much. And then mm. if we cut back the medication, the patient gets all this atrial fibrillation. So then we have to use the medicine and we put a pacemaker in. So now we protect the patient from the low heart rate and use the medicine to protect the fast stuff. You got okay, it? Thank you. Okay, thank I think you so uh, people, mm -hmm. some of people are agitating to go. Yes. So what I'll do is cut it off for the moment, but the doctor will be willing, I believe, to take some written questions and he will also do it on the chat. So can we, um, is the doctor, are you willing to get the questions in writing and re respond to these people? Would you? Well, uh, Firoz and uh, Abdul, uh, 
what I suggest is, could you please send my email to everybody and my cell phone number, which you have, okay? okay. okay? Because okay. I have to get offline now. I As you I told you, my daughter has come with my grandsons and, uh, and okay. I told them that, that by 12 Vancouver time, I will be there at the there, summit. Of course, so it's five minutes. <laughs> Yeah. So we have so please Sultan. pass that on. Anybody can call me anytime and discuss their specific issues. I'd be more than happy to, to handle that. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Wonderful. Now, Mr. Sultan, go, go ahead. Uh, shall I go ahead with the word of thanks? Yeah. Ah, good. Okay. Um, Alnur, thank you very much for uh, making the time to meet with us and um, relating to us in very simple terms and with simple illustrations, uh, the causes of heart attacks and how they can be treated if uh, help is sought in a timely manner. You illustrated to us in very poignant terms, uh, the, um, the, um, and with an example of how we as South Asians are at a much greater risk of uh, heart attacks and, um, and how we can uh, end up ignoring the uh, symptoms and the diagnostic uh, test results and the need for us to, um, to adopt a healthy lifestyle and um, exercise. And I found your uh, effective protections built by the nature very interesting. Um, and I'm sure that everybody else did, and the need for us to, um, to have in our life interpersonal relationships and engagement with the community. And you are leaving us with um, the zero to five to 30 guidelines, which I think are very important. Uh, the food color and category guidelines, which, um, which are even more important, and uh, with the the acids, the good and bad acids guidelines. Uh, those are very important. Um, your presentation has certainly been very enlightening for me and I'm sure everyone else has found it very enlightening. And um, uh, we, we are very, very grateful to you for having made the time. We know that you have a commitment uh, to meet at, uh, in five minutes or less. Uh, so thank you very much. Thank you for being with us and uh, educating us. Thank you. Well, I have to say thank you in return for having this opportunity. It's not often that someone in the world gets to teach his teachers. And uh, you gave me that privilege. And I am very, very grateful for that. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Th there thank are a couple you. of things before people try dispersing, please. Uh, I know Abu Shan put his hand up, but I'll give you an opportunity if you can. Uh, the thing is, somebody asked me, and I think that's Mansur Saleh, wants to take a picture of our group. So before you leave, Mansur, you can go ahead and do it if you want. And uh, uh, before Dr. and uh, uh, Niza Sultan and they leave. So go ahead, please. You I don't know the technology. If, if everybody turns on their camera, we'll have everybody on there. <laughs> oh, so put the camera on and let's have a picture. Okay, smile. Smile. <laughs> I got one. Hang on, one more. One more. Make it two. Yeah. Okay, smile again. Show me your teeth. Not thank your heart. You, thank you. And make sure you email it to us. Okay. Good. Okay, I'll never see okay, you. Okay, thank you. Thank well, you. Well, I didn't know, Mansur, you were online. If I had known at the beginning of the talk, I would have been horribly nervous. I'm telling you, I would have been stressed out. You are an amazing physician and you're doing amazing work in Africa. And you're probably one of the best oncologists around and uh, hematologists. And uh, we are, we are, our community is very, very proud of you. What I want to use you for future is uh, as a technical advisor because I need some help. So <laughs> it looks like and, we know and the we, truth. And we as your teachers are very so, good. so very proud of you all. Okay. Uh, I don't know, Alnur, if you remember me, but I am Miss Alibai. Yeah, I remember you very well. I dropped the okay. pencil on the floor but, many times for you. 
<laughs> Before we, but anybody I goes, really listen, guys, now. listen, guys. Uh, as a sign of appreciation to Al Noor, uh, I asked him if uh, we can make a donation uh, to his preferred uh, uh, charity, and he ma he ma he mentioned Union Gospel Mission, which is dealing with at the moment extreme heat. Uh, which threatens life of uh, some uh, marginalized people. So I am making a donation to this uh, mission. And I'm just asking if people as a voluntarily want to donate, then I'll send out a, a, a link or, or link or the details about this Union Gospel Mission, and you can do that as well. So there's no compulsion. It yes. is all voluntary. Okay. Yes, so I want I know, everyone to I, know that this is not part of the talk issue, all right? No, and no. this is Abdul's uh, benevolent nature that he thought about it and wanted this done. Uh, you know, if you don't want to make the donation, then I'll make it very simple for you. Just send me the money. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. I think I know wants, uh, doctor wants to leave. Please. Some other people. Oh, Abu, you wanted to say something before? No, no. Okay. Uh, I know we can let you go now if you want. Uh, I don't know the group wants to stay on for some social... Yeah, I take your leave. Thank you. Thank you. If you want to have a social interaction, we can carry on. We've got the time. Wonderful. And thank you, doctor. Okay. Uh, the social interaction is next item is my way of uh, recognizing people who have had their birthdays, their anniversaries and all. And in the last uh, two months, we had number of birthdays. So can we, and Hassan, are you there? Hassan is there. So he can, he can uh, do a- He can have a fancy Oh, you look at teacher's meeting. Sandhu oh, okay. had a birthday on uh, 15th of May. Uh, Zubeda had a birthday on the 23rd of June. Any other birthdays I can, recall or uh, mention? Manly had a birthday on 1st of June. Okay, so three birthdays. Any any anniversaries? Hassan, you are on. Can you please uh, lead the chorus? Happy birthday. Hassan, unmute, un unmute yourself. Where is Hassan? He's there. If not, then uh, I think he's there. I saw him. I, I saw his uh, name there. But if he's not, then uh, let's all sing happy birthday to all these three people. Can we? Can I lead you? Yeah. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to all of you. And many more. Okay, God bless you. Okay. Any, anything else you want to discuss or stay on? And uh, Hassan, if you're there, can you put the music on, please? I think I see your name there. I can't see Hassan. Yes, I can see. Hassan, you're muted. I'm muted? Oh, okay. I'm muted. Where am I now? On the... Okay, I'll, I'll look for myself. We can't see you. Put your, put your video on. And we can't hear you. No, I'm not muted. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I my video I, today the technology is not helping me. But All right. So long as we can hear you, Hassan. Okay, I'm here. I'm here. So, do you want to sing the happy birthday again? No. No. Okay. Okay. Anything else? Any other items? Do you want to sit and uh, shoot the breeze a little bit? Abdul, no. I you know I send you a note. The other day, that I think following this lecture, the next one would uh, probably most of us would benefit that we take a fistful of medicines, a lot of them over the counter and everything else. Okay, we okay, have we have to find a, on a speaker. <laughs> okay. We have to find really a speaker uh, as good or better than alone. But uh, if you know somebody who can uh, make a presentation, we have probably a pharmacist. We need to find a pharmacist, okay? 
If nothing else, do you want to shoot the breeze a little bit? Anybody? Uh, Hamida, did you have a question and I, I didn't get to you or something? No, Shamash? Okay, I'll share a couple of things. Okay, Abu, Sean, please. Unmute yourself. Yes, yeah, okay, no. yeah, 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 uh, thanks for uh, inviting me in the group uh, just for this talk. Yes. Uh, I'd like to say something which might come as a surprise. I, uh, Abdul knows me from Edmonton. I don't know if yeah, you, you lived in Edmonton now, Abu. I, I remember you. Yeah, so I'm uh, five foot four, <laughs> 120 pounds. My blood pressure is on the low side, my sugar is at five. Yeah. So five is uh, the range is four to six. So it has been five since I started checking it. Yeah, okay. So, and uh, seven years ago, I had a minor heart issue. Okay. Not a heart issue, actually. It was not a heart attack. I had uh, two arteries blocked over 90%. Mm -hmm. And the doctors, so it was not a heart attack, so I was lucky. But the cardiologist and everything, three cardiologists, they made me answer 17 page questionnaire. And they said I had no known risk factors. No known risk factors. Okay. And uh, the point I'm trying to say is uh, when uh, Dr. Abdullah said that uh, heart disease is insidious, it's hidden, it's 100% true. Yeah. And on top of what I said, I was a sprinter champion in school. I trained very heavily for four years. And then we had the Ismaili 10K run. I ran for 10 years. I was training athletes. I'm generally very healthy. And still I got it. And oh, my wow. classmates thought I was the last person to get a heart issue. And according to one of them, I was the first one to get it. So they were really shocked. Yeah. So I think we should take uh, Alnur uh, very seriously. And uh, it is hard to change. Okay. But uh, I think we should change in small steps and select one item and change. And then the next one. Or change a little bit of everything or one of more things. But please, it's best to change. Thank you. All the best. Thank you, Abu. Good meeting with you again. And uh, uh, it's good you attended. Anyway, and thank you. Uh, so... Uh, if you don't have anything other than to, I'll give you something. I think I'm trying to do something. Is Hassan if I can, I can. Hold on, hold on, guys. Uh, there's a picture there, so screen. Uh, I don't know. Screen, share. No, I had a couple of items, but again, today I'm technically not... Very, very good. So I don't know. You have to uh, basic. Let me see. And Somebody's taking picture. Share your screen. Share your screen. I did. I share. 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 No. Share. At the bottom. Okay. Okay. Hold on. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Share. Uh, nope. No, I can't find the videos I had. A couple of videos I had. And uh, I'm sorry, again, I am disorganized today. You have to uh, bear with me. Bear with me. Bear with me. But uh, if, you was, if you got a video to share or something, why don't you? Have you got something? Firoz? Video? Sorry. Video to share. Oh. Have you got a video to share? Uh, I had uh, 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 Alhamra. No, uh, the Egyptian garden to show for five, seven Wouldn't minutes. That'd be too long, uh, Abdul. Five, seven minutes. It's not long. Five, seven. Keep going. Okay. 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 Okay.